a number uh, of years ago, well, it was quite a few years ago, I can remember getting on a bus <clears throat> and waving goodbye to my mom as she saw me go off to university. It was a classic movie scene. And I sat down on the bus next to a guy who had graduated from my high school three years earlier than me. So we were having conversation on the bus ride down and we started talking about music. And uh, we started talking about one particular musician and I had one album from this record or CD, whatever it is you think. <laughs> And I had read one article in a magazine about this particular musician. So as a teenager, I considered myself an expert on this particular person. So I began pontificating about this musician only to discover that this guy I was speaking to had all of this man's music, had read every article ever written about him, and was well versed backwards and forwards, and he caught me on my coming up short, on not really knowing that much about him. <laughs> and he gave me some very interesting advice, something I've never forgotten. He said, Paul, you know, you could get away with what you just did in high school, but now you're going off to university. In university, people know what they're talking about. They're passionate about what they know. So it'd be good for you to make sure you know what you know. And don't pass yourself off as knowing something that you don't know. And this was tremendous advice to receive at that point. And the very first thing I thought about was my Christian faith. Here I was leaving home, going off to university. Now I was on my own. I'd grown up in the church and the Christian family, but I started to ask myself the question, what do I know? What is my faith and belief based on? And is what I'm believing, is it really true? Is it really for me? And I started a journey at that point uh, of discovering and, and looking more deeply into who is Jesus? What is the Christian faith? What is it based on? And, and that was a very important turning point for me. And this leads us right into our current series that we're in the middle of, which is the Gospel according to John. And John, um, we, we need to ask ourselves the question, why? Did he write the Gospel of John? What was his goal? And he tells us in the 20th chapter, verse 30 and 31. Turning over tables, that's the name of this message when you got that. We'll get back to that. Okay, here's the purpose. Therefore, many other signs Jesus also performed in the presence of the disciples, which are not written in this book. But these have been written so that you may believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, and that in believing you may have life in his name. So John's goal is to help fellow followers of Jesus believe and go on believing. Stay in that faith and belief in Jesus that he is, in fact, who he says he is, the Messiah, the Son of God. And when you believe in him, you will have life in his name. And this is not just any life, barely hanging on life. That's not the life he died on the cross for, but it's abundant life. It's full life, a life of the future, that we can begin to experience now, in this life. He came to bring us life. And this, then, is the purpose of John's writing this gospel. And he does this by sharing seven different signs 
that Jesus did or performed. There were many signs that he performed, but he chose seven. And he wants us to uh, show us that these seven signs give witness to the presence and the power of God in the presence of Jesus, in Jesus himself. God's presence and power are in Christ. Jesus is who he says he is. And we can have full confidence to put our faith, our belief in him, and to grow in that step by step. So, for example, we heard last week about when Jesus was at a wedding reception. We heard about the first sign. What was that? Change the water into wine. Now, why did he do that? Well, a lot of reasons why. <laughs> it's not just a little bit of wine that he changed it into. I figured it out this week. 680 liters of wine. Okay? If you've seen in the Central Marketplace these three liter jars, about like that big, there would be 224 of those sitting up on the stage. That would mean in this room right here, everybody would get three of those to take home. Okay? That's how much wine he produced. Why did Jesus do this? Turning water into wine, taking six empty water pots that were used to, uh, for the rite of, of purification, washing your hands in Judaism, and changing them into overflowing wine. This is a sign prophesied many times in the Old Testament that when this would start to happen, it means that the Messianic age is upon us. People were waiting for the day when a Messiah figure would come and begin to bring fulfillment to the life of people in Israel. It says in Joel, or in our church, Joel, Joel 3.18, said, in that day, the mountains will drip new wine and the hills will flow with milk and all the ravines of Judah will run with water. So changing the water to wine, Jesus is giving a clear signal. The age of fulfillment has begun. The, the, that which Israel have been waiting for has arrived and has arrived in me, Jesus. But, we need to understand that it had only begun. He inaugurated the kingdom of God on the earth. And what his followers did not understand in that moment was that there was another sign other than these seven signs that needed to be filled first. And this is going to be what we're seeing today, the sign of the cross. Jesus would need to go to the cross and through the cross, then all these seven signs will find their fullness and completion. And so let's take a look now at the text for today. It's found in chapter 2, uh, starting in verse 13. The Passover of the Jews was near, and Jesus went up to Jerusalem, and he found that in the temple those who were selling oxen and sheep and doves and the money changers seated at their tables. Okay, this two verses uh, bring into John's story three very important themes. Jerusalem, which is the center of Judaism's political and religious life. The Passover feast, which is one of the festivals that Israel celebrated every year in the spring. And then the temple, this massive site in the center of Jerusalem, which represented, what does the temple represent? Presence, the presence of God in the midst of his people. And so the temple was located 
in Jerusalem. It was a place of prayer, of sacrifice, of worship. So he had these three things introduced to us in these two verses. Now, Jerusalem being the religious center of Judaism, every uh, Jewish male over the age of 20 was required to come to Jerusalem three times a year to celebrate different festivals, different feasts, and Passover was one of those. So Jesus, being a law-abiding Jew, came to Jerusalem three times a year. In John's Gospel, he gives us an account of five different times that Jesus enters into Jerusalem to go to various festivals. And this festival on this occasion was the Passover. What's the Passover? For those of you who may not be familiar with uh, the biblical story, Passover is um, the, the yearly Jewish holiday celebrated in the early spring. And what it is, is to remember what God did when he delivered Israel out of Egypt and uh, with Moses, I mean, maybe you've seen the movie, you might be familiar with the movie if you haven't read it in the, in the Bible. That's where the 10 plagues of God and Pharaoh of Egypt would not let the people go. And then finally the last, very last plague, which is what the whole Passover is based on. He finally lets the people go. They go through the Red Sea, they come out into the wilderness. So Passover uh, festival was to remember what God had done in delivering Israel from slavery. So Jesus was coming into Jerusalem to celebrate that festival. And because many people were traveling great distances to come to Jerusalem, they were not able to bring animals with them for the sacrifices that they needed to give. So they had to buy those in Jerusalem. Also, there were many people traveling from different countries who were bringing, and we all understand this, that's one of the first things we do when we get here. We exchange money into Moldovan lead. And so that's what these people were doing. They needed money changers to exchange money so they could purchase the things in the temple. And so when Jesus came in, he found the temple, those selling the animals, and those money changers. They were all sitting in there doing business. Now I want to give us a picture of the temple. I have, it's very difficult to get the this, this scale of this temple at, at, in Jerusalem. This is an aerial photo, but if you can imagine together with me, okay, you ready? Four and a half football fields. Think of soccer if you're European, think of American football if you're Americans. But put four and a half fields together in length. That's how long it is. Then turn, say how wide. It's 2.8 fields length wide. Almost three football fields in length. So just think of the area that that covers. Jerusalem in that day, the temple covered 25% of the city. Can you imagine, well, now Jerusalem's not a big city, so we gotta give them that. But can you imagine if Chisinau had one fourth of a city being a temple? I mean, every time you go out, you're, you're going around the temple. I mean, it is, it is in the middle of the city, okay? So it's huge, absolutely huge. Now the next picture gives a, uh, a close-up, and again, it's hard to see from a distance, but everybody would enter into the East Gate. Where would you enter in? It's called the Court of the Gentiles. Gentiles could come into the temple area and worship and pray. Then you go through the beautiful gate. This is only for Jews. Women, children, and men could enter in through the beautiful gate and come further in to the temple. Then you go to this little small area called the Hall of the Israelites. And then there's the Hall of the Priests. So you're getting closer and closer. 
Then you have the whole sacrificial area where the animals were sacrificed. And even the women could come into this area when they were presenting a sacrifice. If you go further up into that black area, it's called the Holy of Holies. And this is where God's presence dwell. Who could go there? One person, the high priest, and only once a year. And if he didn't do it right, he would be struck dead. And that happened. And when people entered into that area in the wrong way, they were, they were struck dead. So it's a very holy of holies. That's why they call it that. And so you can see, as you're from the outside, you're getting closer and closer and closer, depending on who you are. So that's how the temple works. The problem that Jesus was seeing was that in the courtyard area for the Gentiles was absolutely filled with these people selling animals and the money changers. The whole thing had turned into a central market. How many of you have been in the central market in Kishinev? You know, they have people everywhere pushing, trying to get past. So this is happening in the court of Gentiles. And being that that was the only place that a Gentile could come, they could not go further. This meant they came in, there's no place for them to come close to God or to pray. And so they had been essentially been pushed out of the temple. And so on this particular visit to Jerusalem, Jesus has a traumatic response to this situation. Verse 15 and 16. And he made a scourge of cords and drove them all out of the temple with the sheep and the oxen. And he poured out the coins of the money changers and overturned their tables. And to those who were selling the doves, he said, take these things away. Stop making my father's house a place of business. Jesus is angry. Why is he angry? Because he knew what the temple represented. This is my father's house. It's a place of worship. It's a place for the nations to come. And you've turned it into this noisy marketplace and buying and selling and shouting and all of this stuff going on. How dare you turn my father's house into a central market? I like what one person said. He said, I am unable to commit to any Messiah who doesn't knock over tables. <laughs> I just like that quote, so I put it in there for you. But you know, that's right, he is passionate. I don't want to follow a leader that has no passion for what he believes. Jesus is very passionate about the temple. There's nothing that angers the heart of God more than to have people who are supposed to represent him, and that would be the priests, the people in the temple, turning his meeting place into a bargaining place. He's not pleased with this. And essentially keeping people away from the presence of God. What were these religious leaders supposed to be doing? They were to uphold the integrity and the holiness of this place. This is my father's house. We are to reflect his character in how we treat other people. And you're not doing that. And this is just a heads up for us here in, in ICF. Yeah. What are we doing here in ICF? What is our purpose? Our purpose is to, to bring people into the presence of God. To pray and to worship. To help people find Jesus in their time of need. To reflect the character of God in how we treat one another. This is what our purpose is as ICF. 
certainly was with the temple. And, and Jesus makes it clear. Although there was a need for buying and selling of animals and for exchanging money, it's not going to happen here. Not here. Now, I just want to take a closer look at this. Because remember, Jesus was really at the beginning of his ministry. He did not have all of his disciples. Probably had five or six of them at this point. And they're just getting to know Jesus. And he's coming up for his first Passover in his public ministry. Think about the, just the scale, this massive temple, just filled with people coming for the festival. Jesus is just one of the men coming in. He comes into the court of the Gentiles. He goes, I don't like this. So he gets that cord and he just drives everybody out of this place. Just imagine. I have a homework assignment for you this week. Go to the central market and just drive everybody out. And just see what happens. And they come back next week with a testimony. Or maybe we come and visit you in, in jail. Right? I mean, it was completely outrageous uh, you know, situation. Jesus is just going back and forth, driving people out. But what's important to see, here is just one man, just one person, who is basically setting himself above temple authority. He's making a claim here. Yeah. I have authority to tell you how things run in this temple. And what you're doing is not right. Get these things out of here. So that invites an obvious question. Who are you? Yeah. One man that nobody knows inside this massive temple telling us what to do. We've been practicing religion of Judaism for 1,400 years since the days of Moses. Who are you to come in here and tell us how to run our business? Okay. Pretty amazing. How do you think the disciples felt? You know, they had their meet and greet with Jesus. <laughs> they were spending time with him, but not that long. And now they come into the temple and they watch him just go, you know, ballistic on this temple crowd. How do you think they felt inside? Maybe, maybe a little fear? Confused. Confused. But maybe a little bit of excitement. They were the ones that saw the water and changed the wine. They're the ones that are saying, wait a minute, didn't it say somewhere in the scripture, zeal for thy house will consume me. Wait a minute. I think some of these prophecies are beginning to be fulfilled. Maybe this is the time when he's going to roll out the kingdom of heaven on earth. And just in that moment that they're starting to put those pieces together, the temple guard shows up and they confront Jesus and demanded an answer from him. Then the Jews said in verse 18, what sign do you show us as your authority for doing these things? Now he could have just answered back and said, what are you asking me for a sign? If you understood what I'm doing, I'm fulfilling Malachi 1 through 3. Don't you know your scriptures? But he doesn't say that. He actually is fulfilling scripture in the cleansing of the temple. But how does Jesus respond? Destroy this temple. And in three days, I'll rise it up again. Huh? Wait a second. Do you understand the scope, the scale of this temple? Yeah. <laughs> Are you going to destroy it and then rebuild it in three days? There's no way. What is Jesus talking about? Well, he's calling himself a temple. I'm the temple. And I'm here. This temple is going to be obsolete in a very 
short period of time. It's the only animals that are going to be sacrificed. Like, let's think about what Jesus is saying here. Remember John, uh, uh, remember what John says in 114. And the word became flesh. And it's, uh, I'm sorry, the 2 verse 14. Excuse me, 1, verse 14. John said in the prologue, and the word became flesh and tabernacled among us. That's the word in the Greek. He could to dwell among us and we beheld his glory. And the animal sacrifices that you've been bringing faithfully as a nation of Israel for 1,400 years, finished. Why? Because what John said in verse chapter 1, verse 29, Behold, the Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world. And how is this going to be accomplished? I'm going to destroy this temple. He's talking about himself. And raised in three days, I will raise it again. His death, burial, and resurrection was the ultimate sign that Jesus was going to show. And it's through that sign, all these other signs would then be fulfilled. So the Word became flesh and tabernacled among us. The Lamb of God was going to the cross as the Passover Lamb to pay for the sins of the world. As Jesus said at the Passover meal with his disciples the night before his death on the cross, he said, for this, as he held up the cup, as we will hold up a little later, this is the blood of the covenant, which is poured out for many for the forgiveness of sins. Now, the disciples, along with these religious leaders, there was no one in the room who understood what Jesus was saying. Nobody got it until much later. Only after he was raised from the dead that they finally put it together, what he was talking about. So that in verse 22, so when he was raised from the dead, his disciples remembered that he said these things, and they believed the scripture and the word which Jesus had spoken. The scriptures has been spoken prophetically over and over about what Jesus was now in the process of fulfilling, one by one, every single one. And the outcome was that his disciples believed the scriptures and the words of Jesus. I just cannot get over that picture of one man standing there saying, this whole thing and everything going on here, it's all about me. This is pointing to me. I am the temple. I am the Lamb of God. Then John concludes this day of the Passover feast in a very interesting way. Verses 23 and 24. Now when Jesus was in Jerusalem at the Passover during the feast, many believed in his name, his, observing his signs which he was doing. But Jesus on his part was not entrusting himself to them, for he knew all people. And because he did not need anyone to testify concerning people, for he himself knew what was in them. What in the world is going on here? Yeah. Wasn't the whole point to get people to believe? Yes, and people believe. But what's the nature of their belief? 
Jesus was looking at people. He could see right through people. And he understood that some of this belief was not uh, the real thing, the real stuff. People were witnessing the signs. Remember what Eugene said last week? The signs are not the important thing. The sign's purpose is to point to someone. It's the pointing to someone that we need to focus on. And they're pointing to Jesus and who he is. But if we fixate on the sign and we're searching for signs, then we're not, we're not focusing on the right thing. When signs produce faith, it cannot always produce authentic faith. So in this passage, people saw the miracles that he performed and believed in him, but Jesus was looking at them going, mm, no, uh, not, not so fast. What did Jesus see in these people's belief? Acceptance of the signs in themselves is not enough. To be impressed with the miracles and the power of God is not enough. The signs were given not as an end in themselves, but were pointing to someone. Jesus, the Messiah, the Son of God, who's one with the Father. Many people say they believe in Jesus, but they do not seem to be changed at all by this belief. There's no reality of Christ's character in their life. They go on pretty much the same way they were before they met Jesus. There's no fundamental change. And we will see next week Nicodemus going to come to Jesus. He recognized Jesus as a man sent from God because of the signs that Jesus was performing. But it was not enough. Because Jesus says to him, you need to be born from above. Nicodemus was like, oh, what are you talking about? You're going to have to come back next week. <laughs> Somebody else figured that out for me. But what about us? What does Jesus see in each one of us? What did Jesus see in me on that bus ride away from home? What was my faith and belief in? Was it just because of my family? Or was this something that I deeply held and understood for myself? What is my faith resting upon? So I, can, I can look real good on the outside and appear to be a person of faith. Yet, how many of us are refusing to face our bitterness and unforgiveness, critical spirit, our lusts and immoral thoughts and actions our hidden sins of envy and jealousy and hatred and malice. What about these things? None of these things can be named in a follower of Jesus. And yet you and I all know we can smile on the outside. We can do all the religious activities on the outside and be utterly unchanged on the inside. But we can fool one another. But there's one person we cannot fool. His name is Jesus. Jesus will not entrust himself to those whose faith is not genuine. But there is good news here. The opposite is also true. Jesus will entrust himself to those with the genuine faith. Think of what he says at the Last Supper with his disciples in John 15. You are my friends if you do what I command. 
I no longer call you servants because a servant does not know his master's business. Instead, I have called you friends. For everything that I learned from my father, I have made known to you. That's a promise for those with genuine faith. So where are we in our belief in Jesus? Is our faith genuine? Would Jesus call us his friends? And do we do the things that he has commanded us? All belief is superficial if it does not have at its center the realization of our need for forgiveness and the conviction that Jesus is the only person who can give us that. The only one that can make us right with God is through Jesus. Faith and belief 